Luca, how are you doing? Doing good. Doing good. Thanks for helping me get set up with this. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. So, uh, what have you been up to? What have things been like up at the bar? Oh, um, crazy. It's, it's been kind of like, I mean, it's finally now starting in the last like week or so to kind of feel a little normal. Um, but it's, you know, we, we turned 15 in the month of March and we'd been kind of gearing up towards this kind of like festival style. You know, we were doing like multiple shows a day. Um, not just the, the one show at night, but then we were doing like a happy hour show. We were doing shows on the weekend for afternoons. We had 48 shows in the month of March and a lot of it was like national touring bands. And so before, you know, the shelter in place orders or the shutdowns happened, you started seeing the tours fall apart because the festivals were getting canceled. And so it was like, for us, we've been, you know, a day to day, pretty much since the end of February, it's, it's been every day, you know, uh, booking agents wanting to move stuff. And, and, and so what we had to do is we had to clear, um, March, April, May, and June, four months worth of bookings and just kind of like totally reschedule them and kind of try and figure out, you know, a plan of attack. So, so that took, took a little bit of time. Um, and then just figuring out like, what do you do to maintain, you know, awareness, relevance, cash flow? Like, how do you, you know, keep the business open during this shutdown? So, um, we we put a lot of focus on our merch. We do we do a lot of merch anyway, but we started um, doing a lot of our own merch production and merch distribution. Um, we've got a shop with like a screen press and a vinyl press and started making a, you know, making our own designs and just having a lot of fun with it. So that's been a cool kind of a bright spot. Now we're in a position where we're, we're really DIY with that, which is, it's cool. I think, you know, we like, as soon as I get done off this call, I'm going to go pack up, um, about 20 orders and take them to the post office on my way to the bar. And I just ordered a bunch of new bumper stickers and stuff like that. So that's been fun. And then when um, we've been live streaming our shows for several years, it's like, it's nothing super special. It's just kind of a little, you know, cheesy webcam, but it, I, I, I say that the, the video quality is not really superior, but the audio is fed through the board and it's all mixed by our house engineer. So it's a really cool um, audio uh, experience and people have, you know, been tuning into that for several years. So when, when we closed, it took about 30 minutes for us to go, well, let's just start doing shows tonight. Right. Anyway, let's just keep doing live streams. And we did that until the shelter in place order went into effect. And then it was like, okay, so how do we figure out how to keep, you know, we're like live music seven nights a week, whether we're open or not. Um, which also, you know, in the history of the bar, we've never closed. Um, ice storms, power storm, you know, outages, stuff like that. We've always yeah. kind of figured out a way to, to, to stay in business. So, so what we did was we started a run of kind of social media driven live stream takeovers where an artist, you know, some of them were in Brooklyn and Seattle and all over the country and we, they could just plug into our social media and access our built in audience. Um, and then when the shelter in place orders got lifted, we kind of reverted to, to continuing to do that. But then we started doing the live streams again. Right. So it's been a lot. It's been a lot of kind of figuring out kind of like, you know, okay, what now? So. Yeah. You covered um, some of the stuff I was going to ask about. But I get the right one. Sorry. If I can no, 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 it's okay. No, I'm, but for those who don't know, uh, tell, tell me a little bit more about what goes into booking these bands and programming uh, music at a live venue because I think that's very behind the scenes and a lot of people don't really think about what has to happen to get the music to the people. Man, so like I, you know, I've, I've been a bartender and I've worked at bars for a long time, but at, at Mercury I've been there for, I mean, I've been a regular for every bit of the 15 years I've worked there for probably close to 10 years, but I was, it was as a fill in because I was on the road as a tour manager. It's kind of really my professional background is the, the 
the business side of the music business. And I was in a position where I got to kind of see kind of firsthand the way that a lot of that kind of that all operates. And so when I accepted the position to take on the booking, the first thing I did was I, I went through and I looked at, um, you know, the, the, the inbox and anybody that, that I knew personally, and I did, I knew a lot of these agents from just my years of working on the road. And I just sent a blast going, Hey guys, you know, we're open for business. What can we do? There's, there's kind of, there's a science, um, that goes into, into the booking, um, for a lot of levels. And, uh, I've got stuff that I'm kind of lucky with Mercury because we're in a position where, you know, we, that, that bar has always kind of had like a vibe. It's like, you know, roots music, rock and roll, R and B, soul, red dirt, country, punk rock. It's all, you know, it's all kind of like the, the splintered American music, you know, uh, string band type stuff. And so like real and raw. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And when I try I, in my booking, I try really hard to not allow the bar to become just a country bar or just a punk bar or whatever. And, and try to, you know, really paint with as broad a brush of American music as possible. Um, because I think that's what it is. It's all about roots music. But here in Tulsa, there's a couple of things going on. We have a really rich local scene full of really talented individuals um, that kind of, I call it the Tulsa trap. Um, and it's the same thing in Texas. Any place where um, it's, there's kind of this rich uh, musical culture, um, it's really easy for the people that live there to kind of take it for granted. And I'd see this for years at Mercury. I'd go in and like when John Moreland, who's now, you know, people pay 50, 60, 70 bucks to go see him. 10 years ago, he was playing a residency at Mercury and I've, I've got video where you can just hear people talking over him and nobody really cared. Yeah. And that's just one example that can be seen all, you know, over and over again here in Tulsa. And so one of the things that I wanted to do when I started booking was I was like, how can I get these guys that are incredible, all of these, you know, local artists in front of, you know, fresh eyeballs. And so we started doing a, a series that was really well received where we would bring in a headliner that I knew would sell the, the room out uh, with no support, straight headline um, for like a weekday show at eight o'clock. And then the house band would play after. And so it went from, you know, Paul Benjamin playing to the, you know, the same, you know, however many people would come show up to where, you know, he's walking off or Chris Knight or whatever, you know, is walking off stage and there's a hundred people in the bar. Yeah. And then it, it really was going really well, it worked really well. Um, but there is, there's a, there's a bunch of, of stuff that goes into the booking to do it right. I think um, there's, you know, it's not just, you know, you get your routing, you get your dates worked out, you get your deal worked out. Then you find, you know, like I, you know, if I have like a Friday or Saturday night open, I could give that to a local and kind of go, Hey, you guys are on your own. Good luck. You know, let's build it up. But I, I, I prefer to take the tactic of finding, you know, appropriate artists that are in market and then setting them up as support for those artists that I know are going to sell out. So then, you know, we build them up and, and that's, that's kind of a big focus of what I'm trying to do with that room. I'm trying to really use it as a way to kind of not just be accessible to locals, but in a way that kind of helps build them up for future success. Um, there's, I mean, I could ramble all day. Is there anything in specific about the, the booking that you're curious about? Cause no, no, that's it, great. Uh, that kind of paints a picture of uh, what's going on there behind the scenes. And there's a lot. And sometimes people get bummed because they're like, I really want to play there. And it's like, I know, and I really want you to play here, but I'm waiting for the right show because I'm not going to set somebody up to fail. I, I would much rather prop somebody up to succeed, even if it takes a couple weeks later to get in. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that Mercury has always just had like, um, you know, like everything, it kind of goes ups and downs and stuff. But then, you know, you look historically like Turnpike Troubadours, J.D. McPherson, Parker Millsap, John Moreland, John Fulbright still plays there several times a week. Yeah. Um, there's, there's kind of this level of, of quality that I'm really, really proud to be associated with. And something that I don't know if people in Tulsa realize it or not, but strategically, geographically, we're a very important market. 
And that's kind of why I, I really dove into Mercury to, to help not only keep it, keep it going, but keep it thriving because coming from my background in music, I know that the way that the touring industry works is there are festivals, there are anchor dates. You get a band that's in Austin and they're going to go to Stagecoach in LA. They're going to get paid 10,000 bucks or whatever. And that's the only reason they're doing the tour because they've got a big paycheck. Those festivals are gone now. And so if that same band wants to do a show in Chicago, they've got to get, you know, they're not going to drive straight through. So they've got to be able to stop in Dallas, Tulsa, Kansas city. And the small hundred cap rooms really are what kind of, they, they are what grow and shape what goes on to be mainstream culture. They're very, very important. And, and with Tulsa specifically being on I-44 and I-40, we're in the center of the country. And so it doesn't matter if you're going from Nashville to LA or Austin to Chicago or whatever, we're in a really great position to kind of draw the cream of the crop from all these really killer scenes. And then, and I get into that because then I get to help bring stuff to Tulsa that otherwise would maybe just drive through town. Um, so, I'm into that. And you've, you've brought uh, some names that are so big to Mercury that those shows get bumped up to Kane shows, right? Like, uh, yeah, yeah. What, well, what's happened what a couple happens times. Is, is like, um, when I'm doing my booking, I'm paying attention to a lot of stuff. Like if, if I get an email and I've never heard of the artist, I, I, I pay attention, I check. And that's a, another reason why it sometimes takes a little bit to get back to people is because I really do research the band. I'm not just mm -hmm. going to, you know, yay or nay it on it on a hunch. Um, I look at other venues that they're playing. I look at what bands they're touring with because if they're on, if they're on a package, you know, out for a big run opening for a band that's a name, that tells me they've got management. They've got you know probably PR behind them, and they're they're probably on the rise. And so as you know, with what we're trying to do there, it really is our responsibility to kind of be paying attention to what's next. So it takes a little bit of extra work and a little bit of kind of like, you know, you don't always hit, you know, one time there was, I booked a band that I thought was going to be awesome. And it really did. They did, you know, they sold the club out, but I'll never book them again because they played, you know, a bunch of Nickelback covers and nothing in this Nickelback, anybody, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's, we don't do that. We don't do Nickelback covers. I feel like we shouldn't. <laughs> um, and so, so yeah, you're not gonna you're not gonna hit every time, but if you're paying attention to like kind of the details, then you can kind of see these trends and you go, okay, so this guy played, you know, this club in DC, this club in Seattle, this club in LA, and they're all comparable in like vibe and size. So we bring them in and then yeah. And we had, yeah, we had a we had a show on the first of March that sold out so far in advance and the demand for tickets was so extreme that they bumped it all the way up to Kane's Ballroom, which is Kane's Ballroom is like two thousand cap. Mercury, you know, we're sitting at about a hundred. So it was it was I was like, Man, I think I got a little too ambitious with that booking. Maybe the agent didn't realize or something, I don't know. But <laughs> but that is something that we we have going for us that other rooms of a similar size might not in that we have a really great production and we really have a really, really great um, kind of ace in our hole with our sound guy, Costa. He has put in a lot of work to make it to where you go in the bar. And even though it's this little, you know, rinky dink former gas station, you know, service station, it sounds incredible. It's, I mean, it sounds better than some, you know, big rooms that you would go to. Um, and so bands like playing there, people like coming and listening to, you know, coming to shows there. So we really kind of try and lean into that. And, and what I want to do is I want to be able to have a $5 punk show one night and like a $50 singer songwriter the next night. And it totally makes sense. And I think it is, I think it's working. Um, I found that, you know, like we had Rhett Miller, for example, on our books um, from old 97s and, you know, old 97s is this, you know, super impactful, you know, Americana band. They've been around since, you know, the nineties and, and kind of this story band and, and Rhett Miller, you know, he can come in and do a solo acoustic show for a group of like really dedicated fans. And maybe it's a little bit more than they would pay to see like old 97s at Kane's. But the difference is, uh, you're in a really small intimate environment. So for those like real, real hardcore music fans, that's something that is worth it to them. And then, I mean, you know, we make our money selling beer. We're, we, 
we funnel the 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 ticket cost to to the artist so that we can continue to bring bring quality that's kind of the, the main thing is we just want to be able to keep bringing good stuff that's great and you mentioned some of those tulsa um mainstays earlier who've been around a while they're uh sort of a part of that new Tulsa sound to use a term that uh, oh, yeah. runs. So, but who are some of the Tulsa artists that you're seeing right now that are kind of on the come up that are going to join their ranks that people need to watch out for? Do you think Man, there are, they're, they're everywhere. There's so many killer singer songwriters. And then, yeah, we have like our house residencies where, you know, Monday nights we have Chris Blevins and Tuesday nights we have Jacob Tobar, Wednesday it's Pilgrim, Bo Roverson and Thursday, uh, Paul Benjamin. Um, there was a kid not too long ago. I, mean, I guess I shouldn't call him a kid. He's a man. He's in the military, but he's a younger guy. And he sent an email wanting a show. And it was, I checked it out and I was like, this is, he's really good. It's just him playing songs on, you know, his cell phone in his backyard. And in the nine days that it took for us to kind of correspond, he went from, you know, just a guy in his backyard to getting repped by like major management and getting, you know, kind of courted by Sony because the internet did the thing where, you know, he had a couple million views on some of these videos out of nowhere. And he's just a huge fan of the, the kind of like Turnpike Troubadours and a lot of the bands that have, have played Mercury. So um, the by the time that he actually played, we announced the show and it sold out in five minutes. Is that and Zach? Yeah, Zach Bryan. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry if I didn't say his name. Zach no, Bryan. No worries. That sold out in like five minutes. So then we announced the second show and it sold out in like three minutes. And to his credit, he only wanted it to be a $5 show. He was like, I'm not trying to make money off this. And furthermore, to his credit, I've noticed a lot of uh, the way that kind of like, I think that what's happening where the music business, they kind of like latch on, right? And I can see him kind of rebelling and wanting to do his own thing. So I kind of applaud that. But um there's, I mean, there's so many, I know I'm going to draw a blank right now, but there's, um, there's this guy, uh, Charlie Hickman, Charlie Hickman band is really great. Um, there's uh, Cade Roth and the Black Sheeps. They're really great. Uh, Chloe Beth out of, uh, she's down South closer to Oklahoma city. She's great. Um, uh, Melissa Hembry, she's been around for a long time, but is still kind of, I feel like just now getting a little bit of heat. Um, Chris Jones and the Flycatchers, Bo Jennings. Uh, I mean, there's, what I did was I, when I knew that we were going to reopen and I knew that I didn't want, well, we we're going to be a reduced capacity. Um, so there was no point in me trying to put a hundred or 200 cap artists in a 30 cap room. It just wouldn't make sense at all. So um, I kind of opened the stage exclusively to local artists and I, I put out this blast saying, Hey, hit me up, give me your info. And I've got a spreadsheet that's, you know, two or three pages long with just, you know, names and names and names of all these killer bands and contact information. So I kind of have them on a fast track uh, to get booked. Um, if you don't know Nightingale, Brianna Wright, Nightingale, they're killer, really, really good. So, and we're, we're going to continue to live stream shows for, I mean, as long as we're able to, as long as there's a reason to. My next question was, um, you're good friends with uh, John Moreland. So could you tell me about your working relationship and personal relationship and how you two got hooked up? Yeah, um, we, we met at Mercury, uh, mutual friends with um, a guy named uh, Mike Williams, who is our, uh, he's now our Sunday night residency artist. He, been friends with John since like eighth grade and they played in bands together and Mike was in uh, Dust Bowl Souls, um, one of John's bands. And um, I was always, I was just a big fan of, of his writing, his music, him as a person. And, and I was able to, uh, I had a little bit of money that I was able to devote to starting a, a small record label. So I'm adjusting the, well, there he goes. Uh, started a little record label called Oki Tone, um, and we put out uh, one of John's records, one of his earlier records on vinyl, um, and uh, just got to be good buds and have a really good working relationship. And so when it got to the point where he was out, he was touring by himself, doing you know long hauls, long drives, selling merch, doing everything solo, and he was like, "I need help." Um, asked me if I would want to tour manage for him, and neither one of us had any idea what a tour manager really 
was or did other than just like they help make it happen. And so I said, yeah, and we, we're, it was cool. It was like kind of at a point where, you know, it was me and John and like a, you know, like a truck just driving around. And then the organization kind of grew to where we're in, you know, a van with a trailer and, and his manager also manages um, Jason Isbell and St. Paul and the Broken Bones. And so we would do a lot of tours in support of Jason. And it was like the first tours we did, it was like Jason in a van and a trailer. And it was like, oh, now he's in a tour bus. Now he's got two tour buses and a semi because it's like just grew to be such a big production. Um, so that was all a really cool, really cool time period. And we went, you know, we've been to every state in the continental US and several times and thousands and thousands of miles. I think I clocked it in like 450,000 miles, um, which is a lot. I mean, that's to the moon and back. That's, I think that's literally to the moon and back. Um, <laughs> pretty close so it was um it was squeezing a lot into a short amount of time and i ended up retiring because i have some digest digestive issues some health problems that are really difficult to maintain on the road so um i, I kind of left the touring business and it, and i let i quit touring last june it was a year ago this month was i finished my last tour um and now you know seeing seeing the state of the touring industry you know with with covid um my heart goes out to everybody that still relies on that for a paycheck uh because you know there's no telling when they're all going to be able to get back to work to follow up on that um how has it affected the local music industry uh that you've seen um it it was it's been really devastating to a lot of the locals um there's you know there's kind of like the local artist that maybe has a full-time job and he's lucky or, or she's lucky and they didn't, you know, lose their gig. Um, and so to them, music is, is more kind of like a supplemental or it's something that they do because they're passionate about it. But there are a lot of artists also that rely on that income, not just here in Tulsa, but in Oklahoma city and just all across the place. And a lot of those um, artists had their events and their tours canceled and, and when they're not on the road, maybe they're a bartender, you know, they're still service industry. And so it was kind of a, a, a one, two punch where they, you know, had a, a massive chunk of their annual income just totally evaporate. Um, so that's been, that's been pretty devastating and detrimental to a lot of people locally. So, so that's why at the bar, we really are committed to trying to do everything we can to support them financially. Um, not just, you know, by going, here's a stage, but, uh, by pushing them on, you know, an expanded audience, trying to get, you know, trying to work towards when touring does start back up again, I would really love to be able to help, um, some of our artists get out on the road with either contacts or education or information. Um, and, and, uh, merch, merch production is a big deal that a lot of, a lot of local artists don't really do because they lack the access for the funding or whatever and so um you know and that's what i think uh earlier i was about to mention the five dollar cover that we instituted related to this and that was you know historically the bar always just nobody works at mercury lounge for free everybody nobody works for experience or exposure everybody gets paid and we try to make sure that everything is fair it's kind of a point of pride from the sound guy to the band um and we used to do free shows monday Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, because we were able to, we made enough money selling beer that we could just eat the cost of paying the band. But that is not the case right now. And so we made the decision that not having music was really not an option. We could have very easily reopened as just a bar and not had, you know, not had music, but it just, it never seemed like that was something that we, we were too interested in pursuing. Um, didn't seem like that would really help people the way we want to. So so yeah, we kicked up, we started this $5 cover. It starts at eight o'clock. If you get there at 7.59, we're not tapping anybody on the shoulder. We're not working the room. Um, it all goes to help keep, keep the bands employed. And, uh, and so when you come out to the bar and you give us that $5 cover, you're, you're making a decision to spend your money to support a local artist. Um, and that means a lot. I mean, it means a lot more to those bands than, than somebody that's just casually going out might realize they're just like oh i'm gonna go get a beer and whatever here's five bucks 
it's a really, really big deal to, to the guys on stage and the, the artists that are, they're kind of depending on that. So we want to thank everybody that's been patient with us as we've kind of figured these, these things out. Yeah. And uh, right now it's pride month and you guys just launched a little initiative to bring some. Yeah, totally. to that. Well, I mean, we're lucky that we have, we have a little bit of a national platform. I mean, it's, you know, we're not, um, we're not super well known, but people that pay attention to, you know, this kind of music and, and these, you know, types of artists are kind of plugged into Mercury. And so we feel a responsibility to use that platform for things that benefit our community. And, and the merch is, is something that we have a lot of fun with. We, we've, we've always kind of just done, you know, silly stuff with merch. And so, yeah, we've got um, some, some limited bumper stickers, limited run, uh, rainbow bumper stickers with our interpretation of the golden driller. We're calling him Mr. Easy Driller. Um, and just says Tulsa's just okay because we want people to know Tulsa's a pretty all right spot. Um, every bumper sticker we sell, we're going to donate 100% uh, to uh, not 100% of the profit, 100% of the sale to uh, Oklahomans for Equality. And we've been uh, contacted by an anonymous donor that would like to match us dollar for dollar. So we're, you know, um, hopefully we can sell a bunch of them and at the end of the month be able to, you know, write a big check to Oklahoma's for quality because there is, there are so many things happening in the world right now, whether it's the pandemic, the civil rights movement, the, the people that are out of work or, you know, pride month, there's, there's all these different, you know, there's a lot of different things you can shine a light on and, and it's, you know, it's almost like who, where do you even begin? Mm -hmm. So so we wanted to try and do something that we could do that, that, you know, made sense. Cause there's also a fair amount of like, who cares what a bar has to say about anything. But I think that, that the people that are, sorry, uh, I heard the radio just get cranked up in the other room. Um, people that are on the receiving end of that do appreciate it. They appreciate the support and it's really important to, to give that. So that's what we're trying to do. Great. Well, uh, I always close out these um, at a distance interviews by asking uh, whoever I'm talking to, what is the thing that you miss most of life in Tulsa before the pandemic? The pop in. I, I'm very, you know, I'm, I'm scattered to the wind. A lot of times I'm going in a million different directions. And so making plans is very difficult for me. So I'm a real big fan, big fan of the pop in, whether it's popping in at a restaurant and eating or popping in at, you know, Best Buy because I want to look around and check out speakers or something like that. Um, I miss being able to do that. Um, but also that's really, really, really low on the list of, of priorities right now. And so I'm, I consider myself lucky that if that's the, the worst thing that, that, that I can think of, um, then I'm doing okay. The minor inconveniences of the pandemic. Yeah. yeah it's really not, you know, for me personally, I am in a, a position of, you know, I, you know, I was out of work for a couple of weeks. Technically, we never stopped working. We were, you know, we were just out of a paycheck for a couple of weeks. But um, the owners of the business all, you know, really stepped up to take care of us staff and, and, and put in a lot of work to make sure that we were okay and could ride it out. And so now we're to a point where the, uh, you know, we're, we're probably going to be okay. We're just going to keep it going. And so we're switching focus to um, supporting as many other individuals as we can and just really leaning into making Mercury the kind of place where, you know, uh, it's it's open and, and yeah. welcome to everybody. Oh, and uh, one last thing. I remember from our conversation earlier that uh, for those who still don't feel comfortable coming in to uh, grab a beer and pay the cover and watch live music, you guys are instituting a pay-per-view style. Yeah, in the absolutely. Future, right? yeah. So there's a, there's a couple of things. There's the, the live streaming, which we will always do, which is just free. We just fire it up anytime a band comes through. Um, and you know, it's, it's a really quality audio mix. It's fed to our YouTube, our Twitter, our Facebook. So you can watch on multiple platforms for free, um, pretty much every single night. We want to do that as a way to support the people that are not comfortable going out socially because we understand that that's, you know, still a very real component of, of daily life for a lot of people. And we, you know, music is, uh, I feel like music is a basic human right. Um, and so we want to. We want to help deliver that to people. But then we also want to be able to offer a option to continue to draw in some of these 
respected national touring bands that, you know, if, if they come in and they're like, Hey, we've got to be able to sell X amount of tickets, but we're not able to sell X amount of tickets because of the pandemic. And we need to allow people room to spread out. We can offset that by offering a digital pay-per-view ticket where it's a high def, you know, live stream quality audio, um, through a digital, uh, ticketing platform to where it's maybe, you know, seven or 10 bucks or whatever it is. That's all decided by, by the artist and the production costs. A lot of people don't realize this, but you, you know, if you got a sound guy and a camera guy and, you know, uh, stage hands, they all get paid too. It's, you know, it's all, so all of that, um, that, that, that expense for that pay-per-view is just going to go to kind of supplement that, but it will give music fans the opportunity to watch, you know, a live show the same way they would, you know, WrestleMania or boxing or something like that for, you know, a, a name artist that, that, that they would otherwise probably pay a lot of money to go see, you know, live. So that's, that's in the works. That's in the pipeline. Yeah. Well, thanks for uh, talking with me. You know, Rube will always continue supporting you guys, pushing your events, making sure people know what's going on in Tulsa. And you guys are one of the realest, uh, small dive bars and music venues in town. So I appreciate you talking to me. Thank you so much, Mason. I appreciate yeah. it, dude. Have a good one. Stay safe out there.